So welcome to the fifth and final week of a message series for Lent that we've been calling Catholic Guilt. In this series, we've been digging into the messy mix of sin, guilt, and shame. Catholic guilt is kind of a catch-all term for where the ideas and experiences people have come from. But really, no matter your religious perspective or affiliation, guilt and shame is something that all people experience. Unprocessed guilt and shame can be a huge roadblock to living a healthy, full, and hopeful life. So that's why we've been digging into this topic, because we all need help and hope when it comes to guilt and shame in our lives. If you missed any of the previous weeks of this series, you can go back and check them out on our website. As we conclude this series today, we're going to look at where we go from here. And to do that, we're going to jump into another amazing and meaningful story from the Gospel of John. Here's how it begins. The sisters of Lazarus sent word to Jesus saying, Master, the one you love is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. One thing I love about this story is that it shows us the humanness of Jesus. He didn't just have disciples. He had friends. These three siblings, Lazarus and his sisters, Martha and Mary, were close friends of Jesus which is why Lazarus is referred to as the one you love. Jesus says Lazarus' illness is not to end in death, adding that the illness will be used for God's glory. These words echo the words of Jesus from last week's gospel, that the works of God might be made visible through the man born blind. Now, the next two lines are a little confusing. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that he was ill, he remained for two days in the place where he was. These two sentences don't seem to make sense together. First, we're reminded that Jesus loves Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, and yet... He delays going to see them when Lazarus is ill. And this isn't a delay of a few hours. It's a couple of days. The timing makes it seem like Jesus doesn't care about Lazarus' suffering or the suffering of Martha and Mary. He seems indifferent to their pain. Sometimes it seems like Jesus is indifferent to our hurt, our pain, or shame. He doesn't seem to show up or act as quickly as we would like. This is a reality that John, the gospel writer, is naming for us. God's timing often doesn't make sense to us. When it comes to healing from shame and guilt, we can feel frustrated that we still experience shame over something from the past, maybe even decades ago. But just because healing takes a long time, it doesn't mean God isn't working. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you or isn't with you. In fact, what it does mean is that God is not done with you not done healing you. There's more to the story, just like there's more to today's gospel story. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary sat at home. People handle pain in different ways. Martha is the doer the active person. She goes out to meet Jesus. 
Mary is more reflective. She stays at home. Some people handle shame and guilt by getting busy. They try to block it out or distract themselves from the feelings of guilt. Other people withdraw into themselves. They get quiet and go deep into their interior world. Sometimes we try both of these approaches, whatever keeps the guilt and shame at bay for the moment. So Martha goes out to meet Jesus as he finally gets there. And she says to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Martha is blunt and direct with Jesus. You could have done something about this. She's angry, and understandably so. Martha is such a helpful example for us because people think that they can't get angry at God, but you can. Do you know what it's called when you tell God how angry you are with him? It's called prayer. I'm serious. Many of the Psalms are loud and boisterous expressions of hurt and frustration that God isn't coming quickly to help. If you feel angry with God, go ahead and let him know. If you feel like he has let you down, tell him. You can even yell at God because eventually it allows you to process your feelings in the context of your relationship with God. That's what Martha did. Eventually, she balances her feelings with her belief in Jesus. She's angry, but she's also faithful. She says, I still believe you can do anything. I believe in who you are, even though I'm in pain and I'm struggling and I don't get it. So then Jesus says to Martha, your brother will rise. Martha said, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. To Martha, it must have felt like Jesus is offering a trite platitude, like someone's unhelpful comment at a wake. You'll see them again in heaven. That may be true, but it's incredibly unhelpful in the moment. It bypasses and short circuits the very real pain of loss. That's not what Jesus is doing here. He invites Martha to go deeper. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who, believe, who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Through his resurrection from the dead, Jesus conquers and overcomes death, sin, shame, and suffering of every kind. And not only does he overcome it, But through belief in him, we can overcome these very same things. But do we believe that? Do we believe healing from shame and sin and even death is really possible? If we believe that to our core, it doesn't mean we won't get wounded or suffer loss or shame. We believe we can recover from the shame. We believe that God will bring good from the pain. Martha believes. Well, next, Mary enters the scene. Mary comes to Jesus and falls at his feet, weeping. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her weeping, He became perturbed and deeply troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. Jesus feels the fullness of human emotions. He weeps with Mary 
because he meets her exactly where she is at. Martha wanted to have a conversation, but Mary needs someone to weep with her. And that's exactly what Jesus does. It's remarkable to think that our God weeps with us, but he does. Pain and shame are some of the heaviest emotions we experience. And Jesus doesn't try to convince us not to feel them or to just block them out or blow past them. He actually enters into feeling them with us. This is the power of empathy. Someone who feels with us. Empathy from God and from others is a critical way that we can begin to heal from shame. This is a power you have with every person in your life, not to convince them that they shouldn't feel bad, but to enter into their feelings with them. This is part of how we heal one another. The story goes on. So Jesus, perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay across it. Jesus said, take away the stone. (laughs) Now we know Jesus is about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Why doesn't he just remove the stone himself? Surely if he can raise someone from the dead, he can roll away a stone. But like we saw last week, Jesus wants the people in this story and us in our own stories to participate in our own healing. So they do it. They take this step of faith, even though it doesn't seem to make any sense. And then Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial bands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to them, untie him and let him go. This is the most clear image of what Jesus wants to do for us in our sin, guilt, pain, or shame. Shame is a reality that imprisons us. It ties us up. Healing is ultimately about unbinding you from the things that are keeping you back, the hurts and hang-ups that keep you from being the person that you want to be the person that God made you to be. Jesus looks at your shame and guilt, and he says to, of you what he said of Lazarus. Untie him and let him go. Let her go. You know, I will be the very first to admit that this has been a very difficult topic to engage with. And if you feel that way, I would just encourage you by saying, that means you're doing it right. This is actually the point of Lent. It's not just about giving up chocolate. It's about digging deeper and being open to real life transformation. It's about preparing to experience the new life that God has in store for us at Easter, our own personal resurrection after the pattern of Jesus. Our shame and guilt is exactly where God wants to meet us because it can have such a deep hold on our hearts and our lives. And because of that, our struggles with shame and guilt have the potential for deep encounter with God, for transformation and life change. Every bit of shame you have is a stepping stone, an invitation to grow closer to God. Can you make the leap to being willing to view it that way? Guilt and shame isn't something to run away from. It's something to uncover so that we can participate 
in God's desire to heal us. So where do we go from here, practically speaking? Well, I think many of us are at different places with this topic. You may feel that you haven't experienced healing. Like Martha and Mary, you're in pain, and you feel like God hasn't shown up yet. That's a tough place to be. Like Martha and Mary, don't be afraid to express your anger and frustration to God. Ask God why he hasn't shown up, why you can't see what he's doing, or why you can't see a path forward. And ask yourself honestly, do I believe that God can give me what I truly need? For those who feel like your healing is in process, you've started to work at it, but there's more work to be done, I just want to encourage you to keep going. Keep going to your small group or get into a small group. Ask people in your life to encourage you to keep going. Keep praying about it. Come to our worship night as a way to keep going. Read a book about healing. We highly recommend the book Reclaim Regret, which has inspired us during this series. You can stop by the info desk after Mass if you want to check it out. For those who feel you have experienced healing, share your story with us and with others. Talk with someone about your healing story. Let us know what God has done by sending an email to stories at newroadscatholic.org. A great step is just to write it down. What changed? What happened? How did it happen? God heals because he loves you and wants you to experience his love. God also heals you so that your life will show his love to others. Your healing isn't only about you. It's also about revealing the glory of God to others. Your healing isn't the end. It's actually the beginning of someone else's story. Because healed people heal people. It's a fact that we all have guilt and shame, and there is no quick-fix solution. But instead of denying or ignoring the reality of shame and guilt, recognizing its presence in our lives and understanding how it affects us is a huge step toward being open to the healing that God wants us to experience. That healing doesn't happen all at once. It only comes over time and always with our participation and effort, with our steps of faith, leaning on God and on one another. Guilt and shame are real and unavoidable human experience. The good news is that there is a road to healing. We can start that journey because we know who is calling us. Jesus is calling us, leading us to healing and to new life every day of our lives.